They are Uncle Sam's constant companion, staring down on us from the sky with a burning intensity. Their capabilities are guarded with the highest levels of secrecy. Their intelligence has the power to shape the world every single day, and they are always, always watching. In a civilization that dreams of wandering the stars for the sake of curiosity and exploration, America's spy satellites travel through space with a precision and a purpose unmatched. They are not idle wanderers. They are not meant for adoration or aspiration. They are meant to see everything and bring both knowledge and power to those select few leaders who can command them. On today's episode of Astrographics, we're going to take a look at the spy satellites past and present in America's employ. We'll explore how they became the most important element of the global space race, what they're capable of, and what they mean for the future of surveillance and the future of space travel itself. Wind back the clock a few decades, the height of the Cold War, and the space race was well underway. The Americans and the Soviets were battling for supremacy in every field that they could imagine, be it science, technology, culture or geopolitics, but nothing captured the world's fascination quite as powerfully as both nations' attempts to get to space. Yet for as high-minded and innovative as the space race was, the saga that brought Yuri Gagarin to space and Neil Armstrong to the moon was only one half of it. And so far as the Americans and the Soviets were concerned, it wasn't even the important half. No, ask the right people, get the right security clearances, and a person who really knew about the space race knew that it was only about one thing and one thing only. War. The Americans and the Soviets alike were hell-bent on building rockets that could fly farther and carry heavier and more dangerous payloads. They were obsessed with building systems that could keep their people safe from nuclear bombardment, and they were adamant that they'd develop next-generation lasers and other space weapons before their sworn enemy could do the same. But even more important than the ability to threaten with weapons was the ability to gather intelligence. And as cool as the Cold War's spy planes were, they still just didn't cut it. The American SR-71 was a technological marvel. Its U-2 became an enduring symbol of US air power, and the Soviet Tupolev line of intelligence drones, its MiG-25R and its M-55 Geophysica were all impressive in their own right. But they could all be shot down with technology both the Americans and the Soviets knew was coming. They were also constantly in need of maintenance and time on the ground. Further, they took a long time to design and manufacture, and the images they produced, while well, quite useful, still only covered narrow strips of land where details on the periphery would often be missed. Instead, both nations set about creating spy satellites that could solve all those issues at once. In the United States, that project got underway all the way back in 1955, when a panel of experts working for the Eisenhower administration produced the first proposal for a reconnaissance satellite all the way back in 1955. It was too much for American engineering at the time, but it would go on to lay the groundwork for America's first spy satellite program, Corona. Around the same time, the Soviets were working on an artificial satellite Sputnik 1 that was mostly a showpiece and a technology demonstrator, but when they launched Sputnik, they set in place a critical rule that allows all spy satellites to function. That is to say, they didn't ask for American approval to orbit over the United States, and the US didn't ask them to get approval. Space was established as an international domain, where any satellite could fly over anywhere it wished, meaning that as soon as either nation did figure out how to get a decent spy satellite into orbit, they were fair game. By 1960, the American CIA was putting on pressure to get a spy satellite in orbit ASAP. The U-2 spy plane was getting riskier and riskier to fly over the Soviet Union, and one had even been shot down in that same year. Eisenhower threw his personal endorsement behind the project, named Corona, in 1959, and satellites started launching into orbits, or at least in the general direction of orbits, in that very same year. But by mid-1960, 12 satellites had tried and failed to establish a watchful presence in orbit. Some failed because of issues with the cameras. Some had their film burn up on re-entry, and others never reached orbit in the first place. In August of 1960, though, the US did it, launching a Corona satellite into orbit as expected, having it return with an empty film capsule that didn't burn up, and completing recovery via airplane. That was humanity's first successful recovery of an item dropped from space, a record the Soviets would have otherwise claimed when they performed the same feat just nine days later. It wasn't the first American surveillance satellite launched into orbit. That distinction would instead go to the Navy's Galactic Radiation and Background Program, or GRAB, but the overall value Corona ultimately provided went well beyond anything GRAB achieved. After that, the US launched dozens of Corona satellites per year every year, with a 100% mission success 
rate from 1966 all the way to 1972. It was these satellite launches that proved to the US that the Soviets weren't nearly so well armed with intercontinental ballistic missiles as America had initially believed, and they established that America at one point had well over five times the number of long-range bombers that the Soviets did, conferring a massive advantage for the rest of the Cold War. By 1972, America's reconnaissance satellites had delivered well over 800,000 photos of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. Corona was so successful that it outlived two programs meant to replace it, Samos and Gambit, and when it was finally ousted by a line of satellites called Midas, it went down in history as one of the most successful reconnaissance efforts ever. Midas was a major improvement on the Corona program, integrating new sensors that could detect heat surges that correspond to the launch of intercontinental ballistic missiles from the surface of the Earth. Midas didn't need to drop camera film back to Earth in single-use satellite packages. Instead, it could beam back data instantaneously using radio transmissions to describe when and where a launch had been detected. With just 12 satellites orbiting over 2,000 miles above the surface of the Earth, it was far more cost-effective and manageable than the Corona system had ever been. Even today, Midas is still shrouded in secrecy, so it's not totally clear what they managed to achieve, but unfortunately, the program ultimately went down as a failure. For one thing, it was only designed to detect liquid-fueled rocket exhaust, not the solid fuel propulsion mechanism that would eventually become much more widely used. Not only that, but several satellites failed, and the group of people managing the program somehow managed to completely squander America's faith in their competence. The system that replaced Midas ended up being a whole lot better. Its name was the Defense Support Program, short and DSP, and it still serves as America's principal early warning system to detect missiles and spacecraft launches, as well as nuclear explosions to this day. The satellites first went into orbit in 1970, and in total, 23 of them were launched, with the launch program running so long that the most recent launch happened in 2007. The system has commanded the respect of the US intelligence community and the military for decades, and it's proven itself highly effective in providing intelligence for a wide range of conflicts around the world. Then there's the KH-11 Kennan, a class of reconnaissance satellites first launched into orbit in late 1976. Kennan is still highly classified to this day, but it's widely understood to be among the most successful spy satellites in history. Among the targets Kennan is believed to have imaged includes a large-scale accounting of both the Soviet Union and China during the Cold War, and Sudan and Afghanistan in the wake of the U.S. Embassy bombings. The latest block of Kennan satellites, Block 5, has had new satellites launched as recently as 2022, as the program approaches 50 years of continuous operation. The images produced by Kennan indicate a high image resolution even on the old model satellites, and the images produced by the new model satellites rarely, if ever, surface for the public eye. In the modern day, the United States States uses spy satellites for a whole lot more than just keeping a watch for ICBMs, and there are a whole range of advanced devices in America's arsenal meant to fulfill a wide variety of mission roles. Many of these are shrouded in secrecy, with the full extent of the abilities and the data they collect still not known to the public. America's Space Force, in particular, operates a growing number of these satellites. For example, the Space-Based Space Surveillance System, or SBSS, uses a small fleet of spacecraft to detect and track objects orbiting the Earth, that is to say, it's spying on spies satellites. It includes one satellite called the Pathfinder that's meant to examine other spacecraft with its camera, and several called the Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program, or GSSAP. The GSSAP satellites are able to conduct close approach missions to intersect with the orbit of satellites from other nations, taking a closer look at them and what they've got on board. Other satellites operate by way of the Air Force, the CIA, the National Reconnaissance Office, and more. And while many of those programs are tightly classified, they're largely understood to fall into three main categories. Imaging and tracking, orbital early warning, and signals intelligence. It's signals intelligence that is the fastest growing feature of America's orbital capabilities as satellites become better and better at intercepting communications beamed through other satellites. Some are believed to do this by flying close to the satellites of other nations and listening in on them directly. Others are able to intercept incoming transmissions from afar. Whether the US is able to simply keep track of who's sending how many transmissions and to where, or whether it can decrypt those communications and read everybody else's secret love letters, is harder to say, and we don't expect that the US is going to provide any clarification anytime soon. Since the earliest American surveillance satellites, the technology the US puts into orbit tends to be among the best it can offer. Working with a flood of black budget tax dollars and understanding the risk of being caught in second place when trying to field any such technology, the US has long placed a premium on its place at the cutting edge. The Corona satellite was a particularly ambitious one, especially given the moment in history that it was created. Built by Lockheed Martin, it was equipped with a large panoramic camera with an F5 aperture and a 61 centimeter focal length. That is to say, 
pretty damn good for 1960. With the corona, the US was able to take detailed, close-up images from space, revealing detail on par with what spy planes of the era could produce. Of course, the satellite wasn't going to be able to beam back 4K images to Earth in 1960, so instead of investing in a rudimentary and slow transmission system, Corona was equipped with a system that placed entire film rolls into a re-entry vehicle. That vehicle would then fall down to Earth, open a parachute, and then be snatched out of the sky mid-air by specialized airplanes. That was a hard process to pull off. It required the Corona to be built in a way that ensured that film would feed into the re-entry capsule just right, the capsule had to get back to Earth's atmosphere without burning up, and a plane had to find a single parachute somewhere in the sky. Not to mention, the thing was all totally secret. However, the Corona program was run under a public-facing civilian name, Discoverer, whose actual intentions were a secret to just about everybody except the relevant personnel in the US government. The later MIDAS satellites used the same basic structure, but integrated new infrared sensors to aid in their task. The DSP satellites, still in service today, are a whole lot better than Corona ever was. Orbiting some 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface, the satellites use infrared sensors to detect heat emissions on Earth with a whole lot more precision than MIDAS had before them. The satellites spin in a way that allows allows their sensor arrays to scan the entire surface of the Earth six times each minute, providing enhanced awareness that can be cross-referenced across the entire satellite fleet and provide high precision about just what's happening on Earth and where. The satellites have well exceeded their intended lifespans, and the sensors have been upgraded continuously through time. A more recent group of satellites, the Space-Based Infrared System, or SBIRS, is even more impressive. Not only do they engage in missile early warning and defense, but they can track and follow missiles and warheads as they fly. And the Kennan Line 2 was the sort of satellite that was impressive at first and just got a lot better with time. Early Kennan models had advanced data link for their time, relays that allowed them to communicate with other satellites in orbit, and a solid state focal plane array that allowed for detailed high resolution images. The satellites are equipped with propulsion systems that are believed to rely on hydrazine and were, at one time, intended to be refueled by the space shuttle. The satellite's mirrors on later models are believed to be quite large, with a diameter of about 3 meters, with a secondary mirror that can be repositioned, allowing the satellite to take photos from odd angles. More recent Canon iterations are believed to be fitted with additional signals intelligence capabilities as well as the ability to observe in infrared, and while the early satellite models weren't quite good enough to clearly see a person's face from orbit, we would be willing to bet that that feat has been within America's capability for decades. Other American satellites, ones built more recently, stand out for the sophistication of the equipment that they bring into orbit. The Pathfinder satellite, for example, is said to use a 2.4 megapixel image sensor at the centerpiece of a 30 centimeter telescope, giving it the ability to conduct precise imaging operations on the satellites that it images while in orbit. The Forte satellite is 7 feet long, weighs 470 pounds, and uses three honeycomb core decks made of strong, resilient graphite-enforced epoxy to hold optical and radio frequency sensors that can detect both nuclear weapon detonation and lightning in space. The innovative space-based radar antenna technology, or ISAT satellite, is a 980-foot-long antenna operating in low Earth orbit, an experiment to test technologies that will one day allow the US to rely track surface targets from space to monitor tactical battlefield engagements. The Orion series of satellites, while heavily classified, collects signals intelligence in orbit, and the former director of America's National Reconnaissance Office is on record stating that the fifth satellite of the Orion series is the largest in the world. As for how it claims that distinction, it likely has to do with the thing's very large radio reflecting dish, up to 100 meters in diameter. And finally, there are the satellites known as the Blackjack Constellation, a series of relatively cheap but numerous satellite orbiters operated by DARPA. With their first four satellites launched in summer of 2023, Blackjack is one of the newest features of America's arsenal, planned for a total constellation of 20 network satellites that each handle a small subset of the overall constellation's mission function. Each individual satellite is small and meant to be short-lived, making them harder to track, harder to attack, easier to replace, and easier for the US to tolerate if one is taken out of commission mission, since the loss of one or even a few should only be a minor issue. Recent developments on upcoming Space Force programs have meant the Blackjack was cut short, with just four satellites now intended to be in orbit, but the program is nonetheless a look at what cutting-edge design and development inside the US is looking to produce. More efficient, cost-effective, redundant systems that solve a lot of the problems of spy satellites that have gone before. The Space Force's own upcoming run of missile defense satellites, the Epoch, will use a similar approach, putting a total of 27 satellites 
satellites in orbit by 2030 and will have those satellites diversify responsibilities across a network to handle missile warning and defense from low Earth orbit. But one thing that none of these satellites have, at least not officially, is weaponry. But like other nations, it also tends to work hard to keep up the appearance that it doesn't even allow conventional weapons in space. That's not an act that would break any international laws, but it would certainly violate some international norms, and at least officially, the US and every other world nation have so far held off bringing anything of that kind into orbit. The reasons behind that choice are pragmatic more than they are noble. Kick off an arms race in space, and soon everything up there will be armed, but it only takes the destruction of a small number of satellites to send a high amount of space debris spinning around the Earth. That's the sort of stuff that could very quickly make space a no-go zone for every nation, including the US, and at least for now, it appears that America agrees that such an outcome is just in nobody's best interests. In today's world, America has no shortage of advanced satellites in orbit, providing a more complete look at its world and its adversaries than most other nations could hope of matching. So when it comes to development, America's goal is now to hit what many experts consider to be the natural end point of the satellite surveillance race, or at the very least, the end of phase one. The benchmark in question is a capability called Constant Stare, which requires the United States or any other country to have enough spy satellites in orbit on the correct trajectories that they can watch a given target continuously, day or night, week after week, year after year. The satellite will be there, staring down at that spot always. The intelligence implications are massive. That sort of coverage makes it basically impossible to pull off things like surprise attacks or covert movements of things like large weapons or equipment. No longer can a nation that's hostile to America load a nuclear weapon onto a flatbed, drive it a few hundred kilometers, and reposition it without the US seeing, and nor can they pull off an attack on their neighbor involving anything more than a few dozen soldiers without America knowing they're about to act before they do. The way that a constant stare happens is by by putting enough satellites into orbit that when one leaves a given area of space over the Earth's surface, another is either getting into position to replace it or is already there. That hasn't historically been possible for the US or for any other nation, but times in space are changing fast. While spy satellites are not cheap by any means, they're much cheaper than they used to be. And over the next decade, the United States intends to quadruple the size of its orbital fleet. The satellites of the National Reconnaissance Office will be accompanied by other eyes in the sky, servicing different branches of the American military. The new satellites will be easier to control, easier to modify, and easier to multiply even further than they've ever been. But they still come with a cost. Specifically, that the US will now have to figure out how to pass through even more data than it already deals with on a daily basis. The country's young space force, less than 10,000 personnel strong at the time of writing, will need to grow exponentially in size in order to handle the task. And the advent of constant stare may be an American phenomenon for now, but it probably won't stay exclusively American for too much longer. Satellites are getting cheaper and easier to manufacture and launch. But that's true for everybody, not just the US, China, India, Turkey, Japan, the European Union, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and other nations with burgeoning space programs will soon be able to increase their own coverage if they so desire. And one day, the US is almost certain to lose its monopoly on the constant stare if global progress continues as usual. So if having constant stare capability is the end of the grand first phase of spy satellites, the phase that saw them invented, launched, and proliferated into orbit, then it's also a clue as to what phase two is going to look like. Future leaders of the world will be forced to contend with the fact that because everybody's got their own constant stare, enemies and allies alike, that there will be very few surprises. Whether the next generation of spy satellites will be able to peer through walls and rooftops, see with incredible clarity, or whether the next generation of spy satellite-related technology will be focused on knocking satellites out of orbit instead of launching them, we won't know until we get there. But what seems a bit more reliable is to assume that a world filled with nations who know each other's military secrets is less likely, not more, to try and march past each other's borders. Although they linger at the edge of space, these devices may, one day, help save countless lives on Earth. Until that day comes, the US is likely to remain a few steps ahead of its competitors when it comes to surveillance from space. The country has more than enough practice and experience to put new systems into orbit at will, it has more than enough capacity to keep an eye on most of the world at a given moment, and it can respond to terrestrial crises via swift orbital action. What it has learned, and the true extent of what it can do, are unknown to us, and will probably remain unknown for a really long time. But wherever US orbital intelligence is headed next, it is sure to be impressive.